Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this interview. I feel like this is my first official book club. I've never been to a book club before, so I'm making up as I go along. So please, everybody, if you want to join us on our book club today, um, we are talking to the lovely Michelle Broadhurst. Um, because she has just published this book that she has written and it's pretty awesome and most of us uh, vet rehabbers have got a copy or we haven't got a copy and if you haven't got a copy um, <laughs> then this is what you need to do is come along and ask questions um, and get involved so that you can find out what you want to know about this book. So Michelle please introduce yourself. Good morning everybody. So I am a animal chiropractor. I'm a um, certified canine rehabilitator practitioner and a chiropractic sports physician and acupuncturist as well as a few other things that don't really pertain to animal work and i'm originally from south africa i've been in practice for 17 years and um, now i live in the us so my real passion is myofascial pain together with functional and structural medicine uh, and combining the two to be most the most efficient you can be for your patients Awesome. Well, it's amazing. Your achievement has been absolutely incredible. And you, obviously, your history is absolutely insane. So well done with a whole heap of travel in between. <laughs> um, so um, this book, obviously, uh, is the clinician, clinician's guide to myofascial pain in the canine patient. Mm -hmm. And I know you've done one in the horse as well, haven't you? In yeah, the equine got released uh, last week. And this week, last week, I can't even remember. And uh, we've also written one for people. Um, so one of the biggest reasons why I did that is because I was privileged enough to be able to uh, work predominantly with myofascial pain, uh, myofascial dry needling, and a bunch of modalities and different um, mechanisms of action in my practice in South Africa. And I just wanted to educate the other practitioners on how important it is and how to integrate it efficiently into their practices that doesn't include taking up a whole other chunk of time so that was really the reason for the book uh, there is a course that is attached to it that we are going to be launching early next year through northeast seminars but really it's a it's a quick easy uh, reference book which it's not a textbook it's a reference guide to basically help the practitioner along their journey um, when they get stumped in practice that they can thumb through quickly to and reference and treat their patients efficiently. It's amazing. And I have to say, I mean, that's exactly one of the things that came across to me was um, one, how kind you come across in this. The wording <laughs> is really nice. Like it's really, it's actually quite a nice read. You can actually just flow through it without being stumped every two seconds. It's um, So that's really nice. But also it is really easy to follow. Mm -hmm. and this is going to make you laugh because I can't get over this. Um, but the funniest thing I find that's really helpful, and I don't know if I've just got a dodgy print, but for some reason, the words are not in the spine, like at all, and they're right up to the edge of the book. And That's I find that Amazon for you. Yeah, but it's amazing. <laughs> I've got an undamaged book, and it's doing <laughs> things for my OCD. So I have to say, from a practicality point of view, it's incredible. Oh, that's um, funny. <laughs> um, but going back on the pain thing, obviously, mm. I've banged on enough times that I am, um, you know, so passionate about this pain um, situation. Mm most of us are that's why we're in this um but obviously it is pain awareness month as well which is obviously another really good reason to get you on talking about it now and it's really nice that we've got yet another uh re you know modality for dealing with pain because um you know fascia is not something that's new at all no. but it's something that's almost seeming like it's new because people are only just starting to talk about it and uh, one one thing I found really interesting was uh, one of my uh, lectures I went to with Noel Fitzpatrick. Um, so he's uh, everybody in the UK knows him as Super Vet. Um, so uh, and he was doing um, a, one of his talks and saying about oh fascia, you know, in the old days it was just something we used to just cut mm -hmm. through and cut muscle underneath. Yeah. Um, but even he's acknowledging that it's something that we need to look after and treat. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, it is something that we need to be far more aware of, um, and obviously. It means the information's coming in now thick and fast. Um, so it's really nice having it written down because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not something we've got huge amounts of training on uh, so far. I mean, I've done a few CPDs on it, um, but it's, you know, it's the more information that's coming, the better and more fascinating it is. 
which um brings me straight on to the big the big whammy that the vets always bring up um and rightly so is evidence base mm -hmm. um that's a big sentence so i mean how much evidence is there behind this so there's so many correlations and as you know in, in physical therapy really everything we know we've taken from the, the human world and adapted it so when we're looking at fascial structures themselves and fascial chains if you will it's very similar to what we find in human beings so the correlation as far as pain results and things like that are very concurrent in animals as they are in people so the research is coming slowly Unfortunately, like most researchers, you know, Donna, um, if it doesn't make a big company lots of money, there's not a ton of, of money for research. So actually, um, I've been approached by the Morris Foundation to put in, a, um, put in a research proposal for this very thing. And mm -hmm. what we're wanting to research is really to quantify um, fascial adhesions, myofascial trigger points, so that we can have a better understanding not only of how we can grade them and and um, locate them efficiently, but also actually how to treat them and the best mechanisms of action as far as treating them efficiently um, pre and post. So it's exciting times from the research base, but there is, there is research out there that really substantiates this. We've seen a lot with um, MRIs, ultrasounds, uh, um, ECGs, things like that. We, you know, a lot of these fantastic um, diagnostics have kind of really, and scintigraphy has helped us tremendously to really show um, the efficacy of myofascial trigger points and their referral bases, how it changes biomechanics and pain pathways. So there's a ton of research out there. You've just got to sift through a lot. Well, there's loads of help in the book because I did notice at the back you've got a humongous bit. Only like 500. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, yeah. It's huge. So there, there is a lot there, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. And also, I did read in your book um, that you know that you can see them on MRI, and I thought that was mm -hmm. really quite fascinating. So yeah, um, yeah, it, it, it's great that you can prove that it's there, and you know it's very helpful. So um, it will definitely keep lots of people happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us more about fascia? Okay, so how long do we have again? Um, <laughs> Let's keep this a bit more yeah, comfortable later, um, you know, just no, so that the so. audience are watching do know what we're talking about. The so, structures we're on about. <laughs> so basically, fascia, for those of you that don't know anything about it, if you are t having taking your roast, that your, your, your roast lamb leg that you're going to put in the oven, and you need to stab through that white, really sticky stuff on the outside, that's the fascia. And You've just made everyone vegetarian. <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. Um, so fascia is basically a connective tissue network or web that not only goes throughout the entire body and separates the skin from the muscles, it also actually surrounds organs, it surrounds nerves, and it actually is the thing that creates tendons, ligaments, and bursas. So it's not just this little like annoying white stuff that we've got to get through on a dissection or in a surgery. It really is the, um, the substance that holds the body together. Because effectively, if we took everything else away, we would still have our structure if we've got our fascia. So it's an incredibly important um, network that is very highly innovated from a neurological standpoint. And I always equate it to a spider's web where it's so highly innovated that something going on at a totally different spot in the body will be able to communicate with the entire network because of the um, the neural um, firing. That's so interesting and a really clever way of describing it as well, because, yeah, that makes a ha an awful lot of sense. So, yeah, that's that's fantastic. So in terms of um, treatment, because obviously your guide um, tells us how to treat it. Um, so, you know, in brief, is this for every practitioner to be able to use this book and um, treat it? Because obviously it does discuss dry needling in here, mm -hmm. um, but obviously not every uh, practitioner in the UK can do that um, mm -hmm. for legality reasons. Um, so what other ways of treating it are there? You know, the dry needling is just really a, a huge passion for me that has not been very, um, very well taught in the veterinary world. And I just, I found it to be so incredibly efficient. So it was something that I really wanted to bring to people as a treatment option. 
But honestly, anything in your scope as a practitioner that you can use to eradicate myofascial trigger points, that could be laser, extracorporeal shockwave, your hands, the most important tool in the world. Um, so that could be myofascial release, that can be ART, um, acupressure, massage, whatever it is. The book's more a guide as to wh what is it? What is myofascial pain? What are myofascial trigger points? Where are the common areas that they found? And that is not gospel either in the book. It's just really, um, after treating 10,000 dogs, um, over my career, it's really just the pertinent ones that keep coming up over and over again. So it's a guide for you to understand where they are, where the potential referred pains are that they those myofascial trigger points refer to, and then you choose how you want to eradicate it. So there are guidelines as far as myofascial dry needling goes, just because it is so new and I want to guide people through the process. Um, but really, you can use any method that you like to eradicate those trigger points effectively. Whatever's in your scope or your preference is totally golden. That's amazing. I mean, it's great because it keeps it really usable for all of us, which is really helpful. Um, and, you know, yeah, great. Back to the reference guide as well. And um, I, I mean, I must admit, I am with you on the dry needling thing. I've recently had it myself a few times um, mm -hmm. because I've got bulging discs in my neck. Oh, my goodness me, those needles go bonkers. And mm -hmm. um, the guy who does it is always like, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, but I mean, he's not really because no. <laughs> But uh, I think he doesn't know what else to say. And I'm yeah. just like, going, whoa, that feels like the weirdest thing ever because it doesn't mm -hmm. really hurt. It's just weird. So, it is, um, it is. It's especially when you really get that local twitch response, which is yes. really the symptomatology that you're getting into that trigger point. And once you've created that little homing beacon for the body to go and, and heal itself, it really isn't so awful. It's just a peculiar feeling because of yes. the twitch. So, yeah. It is amazing. So um, Lucy has come on and she has said, hope you don't mind me hopping on here. No, Lucy, of course we don't. Please hop on all you like. Anybody come and ask questions. Just wanted to say something. I often find that my um, equine patients is dehydrated, uh, has dehydrated fascia, particularly in the quad region and the vertebral portion of the hamstrings. What approach would you suggest therapy wise to address uh, dehydrated fascia? So firstly, fascia generally, when we're talking about dehydrated fascia, it really is um, fascial adhesions. So if you, I can use the analogy of a speed bump in your road, okay, it makes everything slow down and not be as efficient, which is great for kids, but not so great if you're the driver. Um, <laughs> So that's exactly the same thing that you're talking about as far as dehydrated fascia. So fascia is very important as far as nutrition goes, as you know. And when we get adhesions, we get these funny little um, areas that become dehydrated, like you're saying, and they adhere. So really what you're seeing is fascia adhering to the skin. And that's where you get the puckering of the skin itself. So especially in horses, you see this more than, you can see this in greyhounds and very um, thin skinned dogs and highly muscular dogs. You can sometimes see that puckering and that's what they're calling dehydrated fascia. The reality is get rid of the adhesion because you need to get rid of the speed bump so we've got a flat road, right? Same thing with the fascia, is if we are not getting rid of those adhesions, however you want to do that with whatever mechanism you wanna use, we're not going to be able to rehydrate that area because we've got that sticking of the fascia to the skin. So you need to get rid of that adhesion and the rest will sort out itself. Awesome. Uh, so Megan says, hello and great explanation. Hi, Meg. Love it. <laughs> Hi, Meg. Um, that's fantastic. Do you uh, just, uh, it's just quite popped up in my head. Do you find that um, fascial dehydration is more a thing with like older dogs or anything like that? Or is it no. just happen to anyone no so basically when you're getting the the dysfunction in the fascia it's really because we're getting a change in the sarcomere and the actin and myosin bonds so if we're looking at a my muscle trigger point it's an actin myosin sarcomere issue in fascia it's really because we're getting that adhesion that and it's because of either a compensatory mechanism or it's because of direct trauma in the area where we're getting all this overload of calcium in, into the um, 
into that damaged area. We're getting an increase in acetylcholine, which creates that contractibility and it stays contracted. So we don't actually have the ability because of the ATP synthesis changing because of that constant contraction, we don't have the body, the body doesn't have the ability to actually relax. So it's got nothing to do with an age issue. It's got to do with dysfunction at that area or even a compensation to somewhere else. That's very interesting. So um, obviously you've used the word trigger point an awful lot now as well. So mm -hmm. I think we need to tell everybody what trigger point is. <laughs> so a trigger point is basically a, a, a very sensitive locus or a piece of either fascia or muscle that is really hard and nodular and it's very ischemic so we don't get a lot of blood supply to that area and I'm not going to geek everybody out on the whole pathophysiology of it all but basically it's what we know in our bodies as a knot okay so in your trapezius if you're sitting at a computer you're always rubbing on that big nodule and that's basically what a myofascial trigger point is it's it's um it's got various components to it and like donna was saying when you stick a needle in it and you get that little twitch response that's one of the pathognomonics of it and it refers to different places because it creates a different pain pattern and basically it is it creates dysfunction in the muscle because we do not have the right integrity of the muscle because we have this big nodule in it. So it changes the way the muscle actually works because like an elastic band that you've broken apart and try to put back together, it's always going to be a little bit weaker and dysfunctional because it's not fully um, optimized for functionality. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it's so interesting. And um, when I was reading about your trigger points, I just uh, obviously noticed about the information about the active and latent uh, mm -hmm. side of it. And I thought that was really interesting. So if you could just elaborate on that, I think everybody will find it quite fascinating. I never even knew that there was a latent version. So I, I've heard of active. So explain. Cool. So, so active trigger points really have a referred pain pattern. Um, latent do not. So act if we're looking at um, from a from a histology perspective or from an activity perspective, active trigger points are much bigger. They're much more active as far as their chemical and their pH levels. So what happens is these little active trigger points. If you put a your finger on your on your trap, you may be getting a pain up into your neck. You might be getting one down into your shoulder, and that's what we consider an active trigger point. Latent trigger points are a little bit smaller and they don't have a referred pain. So they just have pain directly on the spot. Um, and that's the, really the difference. And the interesting thing is that latent trigger points can become active. So very often as we're going through treatment protocols and we're getting changes and activations in different muscles, if there is a latent trigger point that is creating a little bit of change up, of integrity and tonality in the muscle or the fascia, if we ignore it, that can actually come up later to become more active. And so it's really important to treat both at the same time so that we are creating a better integrity all the way through. Amazing. Well, thank you for explaining that. And um, I think we should probably let you go. But thank you so much for talking about this amazing book. I'm thrilled to have my copy and I can't wait to finish reading it because I haven't finished yet. Um, and thank you so much for coming on talking and for an answering questions. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been lovely and it's really great to hear more information and and have a textbook about all the stuff so we can keep going back to it as well. So um, is there anything else you wanted to add to tell us about the book? Um, you know, not really. Like you were saying, I think people just need to use it as a reference guide and to really talk about the myofascial location and all of that sort of thing, um, both in the equine and in the canine, which are now available. And they're diff very different books um, because they're very different species. But I think if you can just apply it to whatever it is that you use in your scope of practice, you will have huge results and you know, to apply your knowledge about myofascial pain to your patients. You're going to have a happy patient, a happy client, and everybody wins. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, Lucy has also said, thanks. I enjoyed that. Very interesting. So thank you You're for welcome. that, Lucy. Um, and also just to put you entirely on the spot, Michelle, because it is um, Pain Awareness Month, um, would you like to give us one top tip for dealing with pain? Don't ignore it. 
and always look in other places than where you think it may be. So the body works holistically. It is very clever. It compensates all the time. So don't ever get stuck on the one place that you think that is manifesting. Often it's coming from a different place. So be thorough, look at everything, and you will do very well for your clients and your patients. Oh, that's amazing advice. I like that tip a lot. And actually, I, it, it does always make me laugh because some when I'm doing a treatment um, or in my examination, lots of clients say, why are you looking at that leg? I, I, it's the other leg. And I'm always, I know, but I'm starting on the good side and working my way over there. So um, so that's fantastic. Um, jo has also just, she's actually an owner of my one of my cat patients. Um, she's just popped on and said, um, very informative. So thanks, Jo. And um, Michael says, thanks, Michelle and Donna. I don't think M Michael ever sleeps. I don't think um, so either. Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you Michelle and Donna nice lessons and a way for me to finish the day evening week oh bless her bless him <laughs> great well I'm glad to keep you happy Michael please sleep now right <laughs> lovely to see you thank you everyone for watching it's been really great and thank you Michelle for joining me I really have appreciated it the interview's been a lot of fun and it's been really informative and thanks for asking the, answering the questions awesome bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.